Hello, welcome to the Boston Herald video podcast. My name is Harold Lapidus. My very special special guest today is Mr. Peter Case. Uh, his band, The Plimsolls, had a hit record called A Million Miles Away, which is also the name of a new documentary uh, about Peter. And I cannot recommend it highly enough. I just loved it. Um, it covers his life from his upbringing in uh, upstate New York to moving to California, co-founding a band called The Nerves, his uh, success with The Plimsolls, going solo, and all the uh, ups and downs that went along with that. And not only that, I'm, I'm in it, sort of, because uh, some of the footage uh, was, I think it's the uh, Somebody Told the Truth sing-along. I was videotaped at Atwood's Cavern in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts on March 2nd, 2019. And I was in the audience, although um, I can't be seen. I think my presence can be felt. <laughs> and um, and it, was a, it was a perfect time for a concert, four in the afternoon on a Sunday, perfect time. So, um, Welcome, Peter Case. So how are you doing these days, Peter? I'm doing great, man. Great to be here. Good to see you, Harold. Uh, yeah, everything's cool. Um, sitting here in my living room in San Francisco. And um, yeah, everything's good, you know. Um, two years, of, I mean, as good as it could be uh, in the situation, you know, 2022 is whatever this is. It's 2022. And, you know, uh, it's insane, but things are all right. Um, so, uh, we'll get to other things later, like your new albums at the Kickstarter, uh, program and all that. But, uh, what did you think about the documentary? It must be weird to be seeing your life on the screen like that. <laughs> well, I, you know, it, it, you know, like I thought the guy did a great job making a film out of all the, you know, he found so many interesting things. And so, I mean, to, I mean, different things, you know, and I thought they were interesting, but you know, I would, but, but, uh, because he found things I hadn't seen for a long time, you know, and uh, so it's interesting. I mean, uh, you know, it's not my songs are my films, you know, but that's my films, my art. And it's different from what somebody else would make, like with all the pieces and photographs and all this stuff. But I thought one thing that was interesting about about it was that, you know, this is the third movie I've been in that they made up that I've been featured in. And so um, they found that one. They got a hold of the one from 73, which I was like a street musician, a completely unknown street musician. And a guy made a film about street musicians on beautiful black and white uh, film stock. And it was lit by Otto Primager's son and all the stuff. And they oh, really? were all kids, you know, <laughs> but but um, he got that footage. And it's really interesting just to see the world on the street in 1973 itself is kind of a trip. And it's a night in 1973 that they filed us around playing on the street. And um, it's a whole movie called Night Shift. But, you know, Fred Parnes, who's the director of the movie, found of this new movie, found found a bunch of that footage. So that was cool. He dug up Plimsoll stuff. He did. a uh, He had some nerves photos that, I, you know, had seen. And uh, he spoke to one of the nerves that was like uh, kind of blew my mind. And, you know, the, you know, it was all interesting to me. But, you know, to tell you the truth, um, you know, it is kind of weird. Uh, I mean, I don't know what to say about it. I'm like the last guy in the world of no, you know, it's, it, you know, it's kind of surreal, you know, to have this movie, um, but it's, uh, but I'm glad people dig it. And hopefully it has some sort of, um, you know, meaning beyond, you know, just like that it's my life. It's like sort of about being a, you know, a singer, you know, so. Yeah, it's a document so, so many different things, it's especially uh, uh, the music business and, and the ups and downs of that. Um, so, uh, um, so I want to talk about the movie without going into too much detail about, I don't want to, you know, to have too many spoilers about it, but just almost like talking about things that are in the movie without sport, you know, I hate when I go to see a preview of a movie and all the good parts are in the preview and then you go there and it's like, you've seen it. So, um, uh, but, uh, so how did this whole project come about? You know, it's funny, man. I don't really know exactly how things come about in the world, but, uh, um, I was, I was up in New Mexico, right outside of Gallup, I think it was, with a friend of mine, Frank Drennan, and we were, frankly, Drennan, we were on tour, I was on tour, and he was with me, and we were, dri you know, driving, you know, on our way down to Texas or something, and uh, the phone rang, and it was uh, this Hollywood film director, like Fred Parnes, you know, and it was one of those things, like, you know, he, I talked to him for a little while, and then, like, hung up, I'm like, Frank, that was kind of random, but uh, <laughs> that was, like, this, this film director, you know, so they, uh, they came up to, you know, strangely enough, I'd just been in Boston and uh, I, I did those gigs, you know, at that Atwoods and everything. And then one night, I, uh, uh, my friend Yukon Bob 
took me down to uh, um, this club. I think it's called Toad's Place or Toad's. Yeah. There's Toad in, in Massachusetts. It's Toad's, yeah. It's on like Kenmore Square, Square or something like that. Okay, yeah. Some is that correct? Well, there, it was there's something a... like that. It was that one of those big squares? And, and like he took me into this place, and I jammed with his band. And this guy was cutting records, and and there were different people there. And like one of the records that got played in there was a, a Persuasion's version of Bob Dylan doing Three Angels. Oh uh, no, of, of, of I'm doing Bob Dylan's Three Angels. Yeah. which is one of my favorite things by Bob Dylan. Mm -hmm. And it's the persuasions version of that. Have you ever heard it? It's very beautiful. And um, I hadn't thought about the persuasions in a really long time, but then that made me, oh, wow, the persuasions, it's just so great, you know? And then uh, it turned out that this film director had uh, just directed a, a film about the persuasions, like a, doc a documentary about them, you know, which is unusual. And they did this incredible... Um, music in it as well where the where he sang uh, um there's a lay down your mountain by Allen ginsburg and they set it to music and the persuasion singer sang it and, and that was another clip that i saw so i i became i i respected um fred parn's work and, and uh, i liked him but he came i didn't really know that at first he, he came up um to san francisco to see a gig and i was playing this club that i play called the back room over in uh, berkeley and um, we had a good crowd in there and he came up with couple of guys from the movie and they actually filmed that first gig that they came to and like after that gig they told me that they wanted to um focus their movie on me and like you know i had to think about it but then you know okay I, <laughs> you know there was like certain uh, aspects of it that we had to deal with but but uh you know uh it, you know it was kind of uh surprising you know but you know we pray for things to happen you know please send me a way to be of uh you know to be of uh to let my art go out and like, you know, um, see the world. <laughs> so, you know, so that's what we want, you know, is, the, is for your music to get out there to people. And so, you know, it seems like a great way to do it. Um, and uh, so, uh, um, as you said, there's all this early footage. I mean, you, you have, you're, um, the black and white stuff uh, in particular, I mean, it has this really, um, you know, it, it kind of reminded me, like, even though you were way before, it reminded me of, like, Kurt Cobain, you're, like, really intense, really passionate, really um, into what he's doing, and, um, you know, someone that you look at him and you go, this this person is, you know, the real deal, um, and, uh, and uh, when you see yourself back then, and uh, what do you see when you see that person that used to be you? What do I see? Yeah. Well... You know, that's a hard, tough question. What do I see? You know, uh, I see a lot of, I see so much, you know, mm -hmm. and so I, I try to write about it and stuff, but you know, I mean, uh, that guy that's in that movie, you know, when he's 19, you know, he was like really on the run, like trying to make sense out of a completely insane situation. And that person had relocated out of Buffalo, like in a hurry, you know, and, uh, uh, landed somewhere where he didn't know what the hell he was doing and was living in a junkyard and, and just wanted was like I say in the movie I was clinging to my guitar like a piece a burning piece of wreckage and uh, all I wanted to do was just like you know get that was like focus the music and like learn how to play and like get it happening and um, it was difficult at that point like when you're a kid man you know uh, you look at yourself like you know back then like if I would have seen that footage back then, you know, it would have made me crazy because because uh, every time I saw myself, I just looked so young and so reedy, you know, and like so skinny. And like my heroes were all like, you know, uh, men, <laughs> you know, and I was a lad, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, uh, I would listen back to myself like, oh, God, I gotta, you know, get it together, you know. But now I listen to it and it's pretty interesting, you know, like one of the scenes they cut out of is like, you know, me playing um, it's like just this rock and roll piano thing. I think it's behind that scene where I'm coming down an escalator on the, with a cigarette in my mouth. Mm -hmm. But, but on the, in the actual movie, like that was like just this super rock and roll piano thing. I mean, I, a lot of the things I love now, I, I loved then, you know, and it's just, you know, I, I don't know where all that came from. But so I don't know. As, as, so uh, I try to have compassion on that person that I look on in the movie and try not to... Uh, uh, you know judge him too harshly but i'll tell you man like you know at some point in there like i was on the street and i like at some point i just said to myself 
I got to get off the street, man. I got to learn how to play this guitar and sing so I don't have to stay out here. And all I did from that day, I was just desperate to get out of that situation because you couldn't, it was difficult. And um, like, you know, you, the traffic would be going by and it'd be so loud. You could hardly even hear your guitar to practice, you know, I didn't live anywhere. So it was very difficult. And, um, you know, every, you know, things were difficult, but I always felt like uh, I was always sure that I was going to just keep playing and singing, you know, I don't know why. I, I knew that ever since I was like 14 or so that, you know, I was just going to do that. So I dropped out of school and all that, you know, and uh, I don't know how I knew that, but I just did it. And so I don't know. I don't think that answers your question. What do I feel like? Like a lot of times you see yourself in the movie and you're like, oh, my God, <laughs> I can't believe it. I don't know if I'm going to be able to sit through this whole thing. When I actually saw the movie, uh, I've seen it a couple of times, uh, was, of course, you know, as it was coming down. But when, when at, the de at the debut of it, I was with my dog. And, and she was sitting on my lap because I had to sneak her into the movie and I'm sitting there and then she had to go, you know, had to go out, wanted to go out. She's like watching the screen when I'm talking and stuff like that, you know, but then like she started to really fidget and like I didn't want her to start barking in the middle of the movie. So I took her outside. So I was spared a lot of that uh, having to look at myself in the early <laughs> days. But, you know, it, I was super into reggae, you know, like, and so it actually showed me singing Harder They Come. I thought that was kind of interesting because I, I actually thought, you know, I was like, it was 73 and I just flipped over the Harder They Come. And I, I um, and we saw Bob Marley play that year. Wow. The first, the first gig on the West Coast. It was the first tour in America with uh, Joe Higgs was in the band instead of Bunny Whaler. It was like Peter Tosh and all them. And I just seen that, you know, and it was just so enlightening and, uh, you know, exciting and so that was another thing and so yeah i don't know what am i talking about i'm rambling it doesn't make any sense probably and what that makes sense. It makes sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> and so in, in the film there's a lot of uh, these little drawings that you did when you were very young where where were they kept all these years did you keep them you know yeah. that's a good question um they came i had i have boxes of stuff and I think I just gave them to Jordan Krause, who's like the um, producer and one of the editors in the movie. I said, here, you can like just use whatever you have. So I think those were in there. I was surprised actually to see those things because I didn't, you know, they were in the boxes and I don't really like curate my own stuff that much because, uh, you know, I don't know. I, uh, uh, you know, it's there. So I gave it to him and he found those things. So those were some cartoons I drew, I drew and I guess when I was 16 or so or 17, I think that one of them mentions I'm 17 or something. I'm not sure. And uh, they're kind of existential uh, angst uh, cartoons. <laughs> but uh, I think there were a lot of those and he, t he picked a few of them out. You know, I thought I did it. Uh, I, th I was interested to see those. And, um, and you're from uh, Hamburg, New York, which is just south of uh, Buffalo. And uh, I imagine those uh, uh, winters are pretty brutal from what I've heard. I mean, it reminds me of the things that um, Bob Dylan talked about when, you know, when he was up in uh, Hibbing. Uh, so, and you do mention how great spring was, but, um, how, what were the winters like there? Well, I'll tell you, Hamburg mm -hmm. is what the people in Buffalo call the snow belt. And so in Buffalo, Hamburg's like the worst place because it's right to the South of the lake. And it's right to the South of a town called Lackawanna, which is right to the South of South Buffalo. So it's like right down there by Buffalo, but like to the South. And um, the snow would come in there and it would be so high that like all you would see going by would be like the top of people's hats, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, and those winters were bleak, man. And, and uh, you'd be walking around with your guitar, you know, and your, you know, your arm would be falling off. And you'd be, you couldn't set it down anywhere because everything's frozen. And it was incredible. But, um, you know, uh, it drove everybody kind of inwards. And, and we had our bands and stuff and our folk gigs and our coffee houses and you know, uh, it, it was very beautiful in a way, too, the, the winter. Um, it, it would start to turn really, it would start to be really rough around February. And uh, a lot, I mean, they've had snow in May over there in Hamburg, but, but uh, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it, it was, um, it toughens you up, I guess, you know. Uh, and it drives introversion, I think. But I'm not sure in everybody, but me, it did. And it definitely drove me into like, you know, just staying up in the, I just remember being up in like this room at my parents' house and just playing guitar endlessly up there and trying to figure out records and listening to Bob Dylan and Bert Yanch and this different stuff. And like, just going, you know, 
you know, just dreaming away, man, you know, and reading books and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, going to school at dawn, freezing. And my dad never wanted to turn the heat on, you know, because it wasted money. So you'd wake up in the morning and see your breath in your bedroom, you know, and uh, that kind of thing. But yeah, I mean, it was uh, beautiful. Um, and so when you were very young, you got into a uh, lot of uh, reading, a lot of poetry, a lot of uh, what we now call Americana, you know, the early blues and folk people, uh, musicians. And um, and it's always been part of your music, even when you were um, in uh, the nerves and the plumes. You could still sense it in there, like in, in the, the roots of what you do. Um, why do you think that you connected to that kind of music? Well... It was in the air, and and uh, when I was a little kid, I loved Elvis because my big sisters were into Elvis. I just loved Elvis Presley, and I loved Ray Charles. My sisters were into Ray Charles. Like I, their single collection was like Elvis, Chuck Berry, uh, Fats Domino on seventy eight, um, and stuff like that. You know, Link Ray and all all this great rock and roll. And then um, my mom. Um, she, I would go shopping with I'm just a really little guy. And uh, she would, uh, and she got, I think it was s &H green stamps or something like that. You could get like a free record or something like that with these stamps. I can't quite remember. I, you know, I was too little probably to know. But she b bought the Kingston Trio live at the Hungry Eye and brought that home. And I just flipped over that and I was just tiny, you know? And then I loved that and I loved, um, so I loved all that kind of music. And so I listened endlessly to the Kingston Trio when I must've been six or five or something, and, you know, Bimini and Sloop John B and, you know, Bad Man Blunder, uh, you know, just uh, endlessly listening to those guys. And, um, and so that was like a real grounding in a lot of folk music, really. They were they were a commercial folk group that wore striped shirts and everything, but they were actually um, really beautiful. Nick Reynolds was the um, one of the singers, and and you know uh, he had a very Dave Gard and uh, Nick Reynolds. They were a very beautiful group, and Nick Reynolds had a wonderful voice, like a very uh, silky voice. What's the other guy's name? It's Dave Gard, John, not John John Stewart, but later John Stewart. And the other guy's name, I can't remember right now. I'm just, you know, I must be getting old or something. But but I loved them. And then, you know, my sister came home from college with Joan Baez records. And um, I loved those. And then um, Bob Dylan's music appeared in the house. And the first record we had was, I think, Bringing It All Back Home. And then um, I started going to the library and like they had a big library. You could get like, you know, uh, Victory at Sea by Percy Face and uh, classical pieces and all this stuff. And then they had like Josh White. That was the first bluesy kind of record I brought home was Josh White and then Mississippi John Hurd and then Woody Guthrie Dust Bowl Ballads was at the library. They had the Lomax book at the library, North American Folk Songs. And uh, I would read I brought all the, you know, I would just study all that stuff and I, I would bring it home from the library. I must've been 13 maybe at that point or something. And I, I just was trying to, um, I'd read the liner notes on the Dylan records and the Joan Baez records. And so I was like uh, educating myself about it. You know, I used to read uh, Being and Nothingness by Sartre at the library. It's like the worst book I've ever seen in my life. It, I bought a, cop, a copy now because I used to read it just for comedy because it was like, like a, 1200 page book and like i didn't understand one sentence in it <laughs> and, uh, and I, you know like half the book is being in this being and the other half's nothingness you know like you know, <laughs> incredible book and uh i have a copy of it now actually i picked up another copy just for like if you ever if i ever start taking myself too seriously i just cracked that one and realized that there's a realm of seriousness that's beyond uh, the pale of ordinary human experience and so um that, I don't know if I mentioned the question. I'm doing a lot of rambling here today, uh, but I, I think it's just the way it is. I'm loving it. Whatever, I'm loving it. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, man. Okay. So in, in 1961, uh, you were in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and you saw Lightning, Lightning Hopkins. Um, and I guess, first of all, what were you, how did you end up in Cambridge, Massachusetts? And number two, um, what, what can you, what details do you remember about that gig or the place or the, anything okay well what what's going on was I, I moved out of my parents house because i dropped out of school and um i wasn't getting along with my dad anymore and uh, i moved out in with a bunch of freaks into a house and uh 
they were all older than me. Everybody in the house was, there was one other guy like my age, but everybody else there was about seven, six or seven years older. And they were just a bunch of complete outlaws. And um, it was so crazy in the house. We lived right across the street from another bunch of outlaws, a motorcycle guy and the night riders lived across the street. And it was, you know, really a crazy life going on up there. And um, one day I woke up and I'm just like, I can't stand it here anymore. I'm like, like people are fighting in the living room. And like, you know, like you can't, agree, you know, we, all we ever do is like eat, you know, clean up these huge, we had the 20 people living at the house finally and all this stuff and everybody's fighting. And, you know, it's, it's like, I just, I was like, I got to get out of here, man. I'm going to get out first thing in the morning. I'm getting out of here and I get up in the morning. It's like, there'd been a blizzard, you know? but I, uh, I said, fuck it, man. I, and I got, and I just went out and got my guitar and hit the road, man. Um, and stuck out my thumb and got a ride to, you know, the Buffalo, and then I got a ride to Syracuse, and then I got a ride, I got sick, and it's a long story, I wrote about it somewhere, it'll be in my, I'll write it, put it in my book or something, but <laughs> I got just stuck in Syracuse for a while, and I I almost, uh, I got really sick over there, and then I ended up you know, getting a ride from Albany, New York, where I'd slept in a shelter for the night during another blizzard, and I got a ride all the way to Boston with an old guy, and then he dropped me off, and, uh, I'm just walking around. I got involved with some guy from Scientology. Let me sleep on a cot, you know, and then uh, I'm just walking around and then won't go. I walk by a theater, man. And I said, Light and Hopkins tonight. And it's like, oh, my God, are you kidding me? I didn't even realize you could go see Light and Hopkins. Like, I don't know what I thought, but like, it just right. seemed like, like completely insane. And I had exactly enough money to go into it. So I went into it. I think it was at a, it was at a theater. I think it was the Cambridge Theater, maybe, or I don't know. I got Massachusetts. I, it was, yeah, I think, it I, think it's, I think it was the poster said, yeah, or the ad. What's that? I think that's what it said on the uh, image on the screen. I don't, I'm not familiar with it, but yeah, so it's probably I'm the Cambridge really Theater. I'm not familiar with it either. I, I know one other guy that was at the show, uh, uh, turned out, but, but I, I didn't know him at the time. And so I went in there alone, and I was like, you know, complete, I was so overwhelmed, you know, but it was very great. And, um, you know, I was just sitting there alone in the theater and he came out and he played for, you know, an hour and a half or whatever he played for. And, and it was uh, like, I lost track of time and it was like, you know, I didn't know what he was doing. And like, you know, you know, when you're, when you're 16 and you don't know anything, you know, it's like, uh, you know, I didn't have points of reference really, but it was very moving. And he told stories and uh, he told a lot of stories and he also played a lot of guitar and sang, and it was fantastic. So I was very inspired by it. And um, I was, you know, I'm a big fan, you know. But so, so that started me off in a certain way. That was something that was like a very informative uh, gig, you know, that I saw that, you know, I saw a few gigs in my life that were really informative. And that was, I mean, just really killed me, you know. Another one was when I was 13, my dad took me to see the Butterfield Band. Ooh. And I went, and saw, I went and saw the Paul Butterfield Blues Band in 1967, mm -hmm. and um, in a bar in Buffalo with my mother and father who weren't, and um, that just blew me away, you know. And Paul Butterfield blew me away. It was just like his uh, presence, and it was the same with Lightning, really, uh, in, in a different way, but uh, very similar. You know, they were very powerful gigs. I saw. Um, the Grateful Dead play that year too. That was a pretty interesting gig, and um, I saw a lot of folk singers play. Uh, not famous folk singers, but uh, well, I did see uh, Simon and Garfunkel play at one point. But uh, um, but what really killed me was like seeing these guys up in Canada like singing folk music in these little clubs. Uh, I was up there with my family too, I think, and um, happened to see a guy Cedric Smith play in a club and um, he was part of the thing called Perth County Conspiracy and I must have been 66 I saw him and like that was those things all really informed it, you know li filled me with music you know like I remember Jim Keltner one time talking about when you hear music when you actually hear it live and you're next to it you get it in your body you know and so like when you go see these kind of things you know they get it gets into you you know in a way that um records do too but you know but like seeing something live and like the, all the all the detail of, the, of it you know the, the the motion of it and the feeling of it in the room and, and the molecules the way they hit you with in that at volumes that they hit you live and everything so um those gigs all really uh, were important to me and um 
So when you were learning to play guitar, were you doing that most, how did you even learn to play? Because you really mastered that kind of bluesy style. I was wondering, is that something that you figured out on your own or do you do it for other people? Or how did that all come about? You just put it together from a million different things. But, you know, I, uh, I listened a lot to those records, you know, so, um, you know, just a lot, a lot. Of, and then um, one time I was a kid and uh, this guy. Well, I studied, I, stu I, was, I wanted to play jazz for a while when I was a teenager, when I was about 14. And so I was studying with this guy from Buffalo um, to study jazz. And um, his name was Pete Haskell. But the funny thing about Pete Haskell is he was like in the Ur rock and roll band in Buffalo called the Ravens, who actually were the Buffalo side version of Ronnie Hawkins' backup band. It was a guy named Stan Zaleste. And um, Stan Zaleste, um, I read, met Garth Hudson one time. He told me Stan Zaleste taught the Hawks how to play rock and roll. And Stan Zaleste was from Buffalo. So when he came back from, he wouldn't stay in, Cal, in, in Toronto all the time. He'd come back to Buffalo and his band in Buffalo was the Raven. And Stan and the Raven, Stan and the Raven. And, they, you know, and uh, Pete, the guy I studied with was from, um, was, was the bass player in the Ravens. And so in the first version of it, the one that made like the big splash in the beginning. So I studied with him, but I, I was, he also played guitar. And so like, he knew a lot about music and I learned a lot about things from him about, about music. But then, you know, uh, one day he was sick and this other guy came, came to do, do my guitar lesson with me. I used to take like a guitar, like a half hour lesson every week or something like that. And uh, I went in for my half hour and it was this other guy, Pete's like got a gig or he's sick. I can't remember what it was. And this guy had just come back from college and he goes, what song do you want to learn how to play? And I said, um, rumble. And uh, <laughs> he taught me rumble, man. And uh, I've been listening to rumble all my life, but I couldn't quite get my head around it. I was just 14, you know, and like he showed me it and I went home and I was just electrified to learn rumble. And I played, um, I mean, it's supposed to have been 65 or something like that. It was like a lot later after Rumble came out, but I was just super into it. And then, so I would play Rumble um, over and over and over again. And then I, one day I started experimenting with the lead breaks in Rumble. And I realized you could play them in all different keys and in different orders. And I based all my playing on fractured versions of Rumble. And I realized that Rumble was a blues lick. You know, it all came together over Rumble. <laughs> and so, uh, I, and so, uh, but, you know, listen to all those records, you know, like, I, I mean, Bob Dylan was played great guitar as far as I was concerned. And, and like on uh, stuff like uh, It's All Right, Ma, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And he would play that break on the first album, you know, which I guess is six years old yesterday. You know, what a great album that is. I mean, to me, that's as great as uh, it's like the great it's as great as Elvis Presley's Sun Sessions, the first Bob Dylan record. You know, I was thinking the other day, like, you know, like they used to say, like, I, I was with Billy Swan one time and I said, Elvis Presley, man, he's so great. And I go, Bob Dylan's like the Elvis Presley of songwriting. And uh, <laughs> Billy goes, I've never heard anybody say that, but that's so true, man. That is like what it is. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and then we started thinking about it. And like, you know, you start thinking about, every, you know, Picasso's like the Elvis Presley of painting, you know, and, uh, you know. George Washington's the Elvis Presley of our country, uh, <laughs> you know, Sartre's the El Elvis Presley of philosophy, <laughs> you know, Elvis Presley was so important, you know, and uh, people don't really get that, but early Elvis, and but, you know, listen to those Dylan records, like that, that first Bob Dylan record is a lot like Sun Sessions because it, it alternates like blues and country music, and so like Elvis would always pair like a, um, on those sun singles, he would pair like um, a blues song and a, and a country song or a ballad, you know? Yeah. And and um, and so that's kind of what Bob was doing on, Dylan was doing on that first record. It's just such a great record, you know? The singing on that great, is just so great on that record, but so is the guitar playing on stuff like Highway 51 and uh, uh, In My Time of Dying, you know, and all that, you know? I, I don't know, I read someplace somebody Bloom feels like, oh, you couldn't really play guitar, but I, I'd rather listen to Bob Dylan play guitar really in a lot of times than guys that play a lot better than that, especially in that early record, you know. 
He's he, he, a great guitar player for years and years and years. I mean, I don't, you can't really hear him so much now. What we, I don't know what the deal is, but, but, um, et cetera. So. All right. So, uh, now let's talk about the, the band, the nerves that band also fe featured Jack Lee and, um, Paul Collins and the pictures show you as the bass player. You're the bass player in that band. Yeah, I was, I was playing guitar up until then. And then, uh, I came into the band and they already had, um, they had two guitars and no place bass player. Um, one of the guitar players left, but, but, um, the two guitar players were both from Sitka, Alaska. It was a weird thing about it. And, uh, they'd come down South together. And then I, I, uh, I, uh, picked up the bass, you know, I played bass in one kind of jug band kind of thing in Buffalo before I left. And so, um, I'd played bass before I had like some cheap Japanese, you know, teardrop bass or something that I bought. And uh, I'd played that in Buffalo, but I didn't bring it West with me, of course. And then I got a bass and started playing. Yeah. Uh, you know, I love playing bass. Uh, I still have a bass, but, uh, I, every once in a while I play bass on my records, but, um, I played on wig, <laughs> but, uh, I did all the bass in like an hour or two or something like we just overdubbed bass because that record was all just cut two guitars and drums. But um, uh, yeah, I love playing bass in the nerves. So it was fun. And I'm um, just, uh, you know, Blondie recorded two songs uh, uh, that uh, uh, Jack Lee wrote, uh, Hang On Telephone, when anything happen uh, just for historical purposes there. Um, and you guys went on tour with the Ramones. Like, what was that like? Well, we, we went on a national tour uh, as an independent band. We were probably like the first kind of punk rock or not punk rock, but ind completely independent, you know, DIY single. There wasn't, it wasn't even called that then. We just put out a single and we were probably the first independent band to tour the United States uh, in its entirety. Um, at that time, there was nobody else doing it. And so everywhere we went, we met people and, uh, you know, we met Cheap Trick in Illinois and we met the, uh, uh, we played a gig with Perubu and Devo in uh, Cleveland, and we played at the Rat, you know, with uh, DMZ. You know, Mono Man became a friend of mine at that point for a little while, and uh, all the guys from the Cars they just formed. They came out, you know, and uh, uh, you know that kind of thing. And um, they hadn't even played yet. It was '77, you know, and uh, we went to New York and played. I forgot who we played with in New York, but. We played at Max's Kansas City, and then we um, everybody in like all sorts of people were at that gig. And so then um, somehow we ended up um, touring the Midwest with the Ramones and playing in Texas with the Ramones. And uh, so it was super exciting. We all, oh, we played, we played in Cincinnati with them. I don't know. I can't remember all the dates we went out. So we did that first part of the tour and then we went out and played a bunch of Ramones dates. And it was super exciting, man. Like the Ramones to me were like the Beatles at that time. And they were um, really great. Um, I ran into Tommy Ramone. He was the drummer then. I ran into him before, you know, a few years back, you know, he's gone now, but, but uh, he's such a sweet guy. And like, I had a big beard at that point down to like, you know, my knees and, uh, you know, I was like completely out of my mind. And like, I ran into him and he's like, you were the bass player in the nurse. <laughs> he's like a super cool guy. You know, he recognized me. So we, we hung out and we stayed up all night talking in a restaurant and, and uh, about those times, you know, it was really fun. You know, it was really interesting. It was so exciting. And um, um, it was an exciting time. And it looked like the Ramones might be going to have like a big hit record. Like we all thought they were going to launch with rocket to Russia with Sheen is a punk rocker and Rockaway Beach. Those seemed like hit songs, you know. So how could they not be hits? And, and radio wouldn't play them. And so that was like a, a that was disturbing. Yeah. And it was sad, really. But those were such great records and they were such a great band at that point. I mean, it, it was just mind boggling. So, yeah, it was fantastic, you know. And um, and afterwards, you were, there's a you and Paul Collins were in a band called The Breakaways. I don't think I don't think. That's even in the movie. That didn't make it in the movie, I don't think. And um, yeah, Paul and I like uh, well, the nerves broke up, and then Paul and I kept going for a little while. And, and uh, I, I helped him put together that band that ended up being the record on the beat. You know, I, I were I put together a lot of those arrangements. Uh, I was a guitar player at that point. Uh, I can't exactly. I, I that was during the period when I was switching the guitar, and uh, and then we split up, you know, he went his way and I went mine. And, and uh, uh, yeah, so so that whole period of my life, that nerves period, it lasts like 75, 76, 77, 78. 
you know, and then the nurse, the plimsolls were like 79 through eight into 85. No, into, yeah, into 85. So it was a long period of playing in rock and roll bands after like the um, street singing days. And uh, it, toward the end of it, I, anyhow, yeah, go ahead. But, you know, the, yeah, it was, um, you know, I'm going to, I got a book, you know, I'm going to put out my book, you know, at some point. Because the book tells, like, his book's not just like, it's not because this, it, you know, it's, uh, the whole thing's just pretty ridiculous, you know, and it, like <laughs> the things that happen to you in the music business are yeah. so strange and, and the things that happen to you in the world. And so that's sort of what the book's about. Like, it's not really uh, grousing or anything or, or celebrating, but it's just saying, um, um, you know, it's just the life, you know, the, the thing we're trying to get across is just, you know, the life's opportunity you know the, the um beautiful gift of life man that we all share that are here today and uh you know one thing i noticed talking to you in the interviews like i really ramble more with you than i do with anybody else i don't know what that is Harold. like talking <laughs> to you like <laughs> i really get going i remember the last time i talked to you and those jets were going over <laughs> over there at, uh yukon yeah, bob's place yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we we're just like rambling man yeah like, I, 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 get, something about you yeah i feel like i can say a lot of crazy shit to you because you'll get it you know but, yeah uh, <laughs> I, I, so far it doesn't seem it doesn't even seem like rambling rambling okay, with an apostrophe. Right. all right all right <laughs> and speaking of, speaking of weirdness i mean so um so there was the paul collins beat i mean they were the beat but in, in england i guess they were the paul collins beat because in england there was the beat in america they right. were the the english beat i mean that's just you know another um odd thing but anyway so he formed the beat and you yeah, i guess you know i so say you helped them and you formed the plums holes and that's obviously covered in the documentary um when i saw you at Atwood at woods tavern um someone in the audience requested million miles away and then he wanted to come up and sing it with you which you allowed <laughs> <laughs> um, i don't know if you remember that but i'm and uh, i do now <laughs> um so uh i, I don't know if he's you told the story about how the song came about and you probably told it a million times, but would you mind telling it again? Like how the, with the DJ and the, the chorus and how the whole song came about. Um, yeah. I don't remember the story about the DJ and the chorus remind me. Cause I can't remember. It was what I, what I do remember is um, for, you were, you were writing, you were writing. See, I don't remember it exactly, but you were writing the song and then someone that the, someone came up with the line million miles away. And then you brought it to the D you, you brought like a, an early copy to a DJ and okay, that's like, a kind of a uh, yeah, I don't know. Like here's what happened, man. It's like uh, um I was we had this whole all I had this whole lyric about you know being alone uh, 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 and dreaming back into time, like you know, uh like like being alone in a house, you know. And it really what it reminded me of like when I was a kid, my parents would go out, I would be about 10 and they would go away. Sometimes they'd go away for like really, really long they'd go away, you know, really late at night, and, you know, and I would just be in this house alone, you know, and it would kind of freak me out. And so I started writing about that. And then I got together with the guy who wrote the song with Chris Fratkin, and, and we went and saw the germs, you know, John Lennon had just died, I think. And um, Darby, no, Darby died. I can't quite remember. I think they died on the same day. They died the same day. That's right. So, yeah. Well, we saw Darby. The night I wrote A Million Miles Away, I saw Darby. So I guess they weren't gone yet. And so it was right before that, though, because Darby died like about two days after the after that. And I saw Darby play at, uh, at uh, the Starwood. And then we went to like a terrible bar and we sat there and wrote the lyrics a million miles away. And then we went over to Joey Alcus's house and I'd left my 12 string over there. And so um, we woke him up. It, it, we didn't wake him up, but his wife, I think, was asleep. And, and uh, we had to be quiet. <laughs> so we were standing outside in the parking there in the uh, you know the common area and uh i had this little guitar and we started playing it and um joey just jumped on it like we played i had the thing i had all the licks and everything I, the whole thing was coming together and then uh and then we jumped on that chorus line i guess joey just jumped on it and um um and i because I, I remember him going million miles away it might have been part of the lyric but i can't really remember and then uh so we put that whole thing together and then um there was a long I don't know what the story, the story about the DJ was just that when the record came out, we took it, we recorded the record. And there's a whole story about making the record because it was a weird record to make. We made it without a label. And um, I got, it's a long story, but 
we were sneaking into a studio with this guy named Mikey. Did I ever tell you that story? And so there's this like this kid who's a janitor at a recording studio named Mikey. And uh, Mikey uh, loved the plimsoll, so he, he was felt sorry for it. So he wanted us to like come in and record after uh, everybody went home at the studio. So everybody, he goes, just sit in the Astro Burger and uh, wait for the light the next next door to the studio, right? When I blink the light twice, it means the coast is clear. You can we'll bring your amps in and we'll record. So we're all sitting there like eating like endless like French fries at the Astro Burger. And um, the light blinks on and then we go running in there and we run in and it's the middle of the night and we record a million miles away and I'll get lucky in the middle of the night. And, uh, and then split before the janitor, before the next gen, the day guy comes in. And so, um, that's how we made that tape. And then we put it out with Greg Shaw from Bomp Records. You know, um, we ended up getting busted by um, the studio who uh, found the box of tapes in their place and, and sued us. And so I had to give them like uh, a huge amount of money because <laughs> the record was on the radio. Mm -hmm. um, and he goes like, what's this? They call me down the studio and there's all these guys there. And I thought they were going to kick my ass, but they just go, what's this? And I go, I don't know. What is it? And they go, it's a recording tape. They go, really? And I go, yeah, it has the plimsolls playing a million miles away. Really? Yeah. <laughs> so we got caught. And, uh, but we recorded it on, on our own. You know, we, we took that record and mastered it and recorded, you know, and, and did it all. And then the day we got it back from the factory, we, is this what you're talking about? We drove to K Rock Radio. Yeah, yeah. Yep. We drove over to K Rock in the car. It was me and then uh, a couple of the guys from the band. And we walked the record into the DJ who immediately put it, we were a popular local band, you know, immediately put it on. And we went out to the car and sat in the car and listened to our new record on the radio. It was so cool, man. It sounded great on the radio because they got the compressor at the radio station and you know it's going off to the whole LA area and all that. It was like so exciting, man. And uh, a great moment, um, very exciting. And so uh, that's what that's, and then that, that record became a hit, you know. Uh, it went to K-Rock and then like, you know, Kale, all the different stations started playing at KLOS and everybody, and then it started going national, and then we got signed to Geffen, and then things kind of got more fucked up. But you know, <laughs> different. <laughs> but you know, not that. I mean, they tried, but you know. And then, uh, um, etc. You know, but that was exciting. Yeah, it was like, and it was a big record for us, and it was just like I remember one night. Really, I was at a party and I was like really irritated being at this party. I was really drunk and I, I, I was way out in Canoga Park. It's like way out of, it's out like where they made Tarzan movies, you know? It's like way out, like near Tarzana, right? It was, Tarzana was named after Tarzan movies, Tarzana, California. And uh, it's Canoga Park, you know? So I'm just really drunk. I'm like, fuck this party, man. I'm going to go back into Hollywood, man. So I go out there and I just stick out my thumb. This is at the peak of the plimsolls, and a car picks me up. I get in the car, and I'm like just lying there. And they got the radio on; it's like a million miles away. It's on the radio in the car, you know. And and uh, it came out, and then they they push their. We would drive. We go over the hill, and then like send another station, and you know it's on, and, and uh, you know that kind of thing. It was just like incredible. Every time you get in the car, turn on the radio, your song would be playing. It was like so exciting, you know, and fun, you know, and um, uh, so it was a good moment, you know, but um. Yeah, I, still, I still hear it in supermarkets all the time. Like when I go in there, they still play. Yeah, that's where I go to listen to it if I want to hear it. It's going to the supermarket, but uh, I know they play it in supermarkets. Um, do Do you still like playing it, or are you, um, or is it something you've you've heard so many times, you you're kind of sick of it? I'm not sick of listening to it, but I don't like. The, I, I mean, I used to like the. If I play it live, it's because I like playing it, but I, I haven't. I mean, I didn't play it during the shutdown or in lockdown. I didn't, I didn't sit around the house play it too much. But uh, I like it. You know who plays it now is uh, Billy Joe Armstrong. He plays it in his band. Really? Uh, yeah, they, they do it all the time. So like, I kind of feel like they're taking care of it. And I don't have to do it as much. And there's a footage of the Plimsolls playing. It looks like a party by a swimming pool or something. What, do you know what that's by, from? Uh, by what? It, it looks like they're playing by a swimming pool or something, an outdoor party. Oh yeah, that that's garbage. That, 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 that's I don't know what that is. That was like some like really fucked up video we made. You know, we tried to get in on that video thing. We just didn't really. Uh, it didn't really work out that great. But but uh, 
I was just so out of my mind when I was trying, like trying to script it. And we just we came up with this concept that was way wrong. I, I, it was never really my bag, the video thing, but that is, yeah, that is from it. Those scenes in the car and the scenes within the, by the pool and all that stuff. Um, so, uh, let's see. Um, and then you get you, uh, the Plimsolls were in the movie Valley Girl. So that's yeah, that was just an afternoon's work, you know. That was Nicolas Cage's first movie. Mm -hmm. And uh what was and, it like uh, being on the set and all that? I mean, was it what was that whole scene like? Well, it's like, you know, just I mean, we were a popular local band, like you know, we like you know, every, well, everywhere we went, we were having a good time. So I mean, you know, uh uh it was fun, you know. They sprayed this stuff around us like fake smoke, you know, like really stunk, you know. But it was a lot of fun. All the people and all the kids on the movie and everything like that were like super cool. It was really fun. Nicholas Cage was like a real moody kind of guy. He was kind of cool. I liked him. And uh um, you know, it was fun. It was just a day though, you know, it was all like that whole sequence. I think it was like one or two days of shooting, that was it, you know. And uh we were like right in the middle of like touring or whatever we were doing all the time. So, you know, it was kind of a nice break in it. And um, so uh, Denise Sullivan um, uh, talks about how there was an, a radio interview that didn't go well. Do you remember anything about that radio interview? We try to remember what happened with that, you know, and I, I, I've tried to remember and um, um, it was probably my attitude, you know. <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> you know, I imagine it was something along those lines or like my attitude meeting her attitude or something. <laughs> um, I have a vague picture in my mind of what happened and uh, it wasn't good. But, uh, you know, it, it all worked out in the long run. But but. Uh, and then you know, there's a I had problems, you know, different places I went. You know, I, I was I had a big chip on my shoulder for a long time there, you know, and. Uh, I'm not quite sure, you know. Uh, what what happened that day we can't really remember <laughs> <laughs> and there's there's a there's a denise sullivan that write re writes reviews of you that's a different denise sullivan right like a music critic Are no that's the same one that was before um those are that was from a long time ago you know oh. I, I hardly even knew her when she was writing those things i mean she'd throw me off of her show you know hmm. so we weren't we weren't really that close but then she was writing these reviews those were good reviews <laughs> but but uh i'm like well this is interesting mm -hmm. i remember i kind of you know but we weren't um really in touch at that point um and so yeah your first wife uh, victoria williams is in the film and um, i started once opening for neil young she was really you know um she's just so charming and i remember i think she wanted she was supporting a jerry brown for president i remember from from the stage um and it was just kind of funny that in the beginning you're uh compared to john lennon and then she's compared to yoko later on which um, yeah, I'm, I'm, a mean, big yoko, I'm a big yoko fan by the way but i think uh you are uh, a big yoko fan. I, yeah, I'm a big yeah, yoko fan. yeah. Huh? i am a big a big fan me of too, man i yeah. love yoko ono man i'm so into yoko ono I, I i always was you know i remember one time when i was a kid i hitchhiked over to um from buffalo to syracuse to see the opening of that uh oh yeah I remember art that. show that she had in syracuse I, I didn't make the opening, but we got there the next day, you know, and uh, it was such a great show, you know, and I, I, it's where I got my copy of Grapefruit and everything. I love Yoko Ono, man, and I still love her. And, um, but, um, I, I, you know, I don't know why they, people would compare Victoria to that or me to John. I mean, people always said that about me, but, you know, maybe I did learn a lot from that kind of singing, but I also... I mean, Bob Dylan sang like that, too, if you ask me, like, I'm, you know, fixing to die and all that kind of stuff on the first album, you know, like a really emotive rock and roll singing, you know, Elvis, Jailhouse Rock. So it's all you know, to me, you know, all those kind of things are uh, how what informed it, but of my singing. But but. Um, I don't know, but the, people say, oh, you know, like, yeah, I, mean, like I know Victoria says that in the movie, but they said that she broke up the flimsolls and all that <laughs> well, horrible the burden <laughs> <laughs> um so uh let's see what's next here um so uh so 1986 you went solo um the uh, album peter case you know i love that album i um i was working at a record store at the time and i got these promo versions which i'm going to show off this is one with um, wow. that was the cover what's on the other side of that what's on the back side of that oh okay 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 and then there's this other one which has the acoustic uh um 
version of um, a couple songs. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, that was it. Yeah. So um, yeah, I just fell in love with those records, um, and I was always um, and you did a, 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 an in store at the record store that I, I was a buyer for a record store, and you came in and you, from what I remember, you were dressed dressed just like the album cover, and you came in, you did a few songs. It was crowded. You gave a lot of um, you know a lot of people uh, asked for your autograph. And uh, I remember there's one uh, woman who was a little bit disappointed that you didn't do the song that she wanted to hear. So you did a little version especially for her, which was, uh, which was really nice. Um, and uh, the, what I always admire in artists is when they take a sharp left turn in their careers. They, you know, they're known for one thing and then they say, I'm doing something else. And especially when you put out a record like that. Um, and I think uh, I would say, uh, yeah, luckily that uh, really freed you up. I mean, if you were still in the Plymouth Souls type band, you'd be at this age trying to play, be in a Plymouth Souls type band still. And what you're doing now, I think, is um, far more interesting. And, and um, uh, you know, it's, it's been going on, obviously, for years as, as a solo artist. <laughs> and uh, so um, uh, in, in, in the movie, you talk about how nervous you were. But um, uh, we're you were going solo and it seemed like the thing to do and you were nervous, but just if you want to talk about a little what was going through your mind at the time, because in retrospect, it's obviously the right thing to do, but may not have felt like that at the time. Well, one of the things is like, it, it felt like the musical thing to do. And I really felt like I had to do it. And uh, I, there was a change going on in my songwriting and stuff. And so I did try to bring the plimsolls along at one point. And, and it really wasn't working out, you know, that it just didn't really seem like it was going to go. And so um, in the summer of 84, I was trying to do that. But then finally, um, going into 85, I, um, when the band broke up, I, I, I had made that decision, you know, to go solo. And I felt like I had to really make a choice. And now, you know, everybody does like some solo stuff and then they do some band, you know, you, you do everything and have like side projects. But when I was when I was coming up, you didn't really have side projects like there weren't any nerve side projects and there weren't really any plimsoll side projects. You just did what you did and uh, it, it committed 100 percent. You know, you spent all your time doing that. So when I became a folk singer, I knew that like when I became like a solo singer or whatever, I really felt like I had to completely commit. And um, I wanted to do that so that so that. You know, so I could really be in touch with the real meaning of the thing and really be committed to it. So it would like, you know, really be uh, moving, you know? And so I felt you know, I didn't, it wasn't just like a, a, a tourism kind of um, trip into acoustic music or something like that. And so uh, um, it was a big choice. And when I remember, you know, as I did that, like all the bands and all that stuff was still, ha I was in Los Angeles and I was like, you know, uh, the Sunset Strip was still really happening, but it was all like these hair band kind of things we called them, you know. And uh, there, then there was a bunch of other clubs where the guys from the different bands were still hanging out and all that stuff. And I felt kind of a um, isolated as a folk singer because um, there really wasn't like a huge scene of folk singers when I did that. There were none. The only other folk singer was Frank, the Jewish love, his lesbian, all American folk singer, and she was a friend. And I played some gigs with her, you know, and of course, Victoria, but there really weren't other people doing it and um, or very few. And uh, and so it was lonely in a way and kind of scary. And like um, a lot of people critic really criticized it, you know, and uh, I don't know. You said this. I, I just knew, though, that, that that's what that's what I had to do. And I, and I just sat in there all the summer of 84 uh, writing songs, man, in that house. I had this like little shack, you know, and I, I lived in a little house and I lived, I just got up every day and just worked on music, man, and uh, trying to make songs that were going to be able to cut through all that stuff. The whole idea was to have songs, man, that just, uh, you know, um, did the talking, man, and uh, um, that really got the job done. So I was like studying songs. And uh, I remember Infidels came out during that period and studying that. And I remember really being fascinated by, uh, um, uh, okay. Song of Songs in the Bible, and really being <laughs> fascinated by Breck Wheel mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, um, you know, just really studying songwriting, Three Penny Opera, but, you know, uh, and just, you know, songs. And um, um, that was a great, you know, it was a big growth period. So, you know, it wasn't, 
you know, the record company was, you know, even like even in the in the movie, like Mitchell Froom still going, you know, why? You know, that they, they wanted to know, you know, he and they became a folk singer. Why? You know, and like for one thing, I'm not really I wasn't really a folk singer. I was writing my own material. I wasn't really doing exactly. I mean, I can be a folk singer, but uh, um, that's not what I was doing in that. At that period, I was writing all them songs. And so. Mitchell from still back on that tip, you know, it's like, you know, <laughs> why? Well, well, you know, because you, you know, I don't know. I, I love the communication I get as a solo singer. I really do love it, you know, and it sends me back to, um, you know, White and Hopkins and all that stuff and right on through like to all the great singers I saw. And, and it's like, you know, there's something about songs, man. And it's just like the thing that set me free. And so, you know, it was a lot harder in a way to write for the plimsolls and then than it was than it became for me to write the solo material because that music would just flow from me. And it was just really my my soul music, you know. And so um I love that rock and roll and I did it all, you know, uh one hundred percent, but 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 I had to grow on, you know. Yeah, it's so what I did, you know, whatever the hell, whatever the deal is, whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, just I mean, it, it reminds me of what that what you were saying about Bob Dylan's first album, where it's a mixture of all stuff. He's a one, you know, he's a, it's a Sun Sessions feel. The first Bob Dylan album is like the Sun Sessions, where it's you know, you know blues and folk and you know all the stuff mixed together, and it becomes a unique voice. And it, similarly, you have a, you know, that all melts together in what you do as well. Um, so one of the things that um, they show a clip of in the movie is when you were on the David Letterman show and you talk about how, um, you know, you had to, you know, you know, it's in the movie, so don't want to go into too much, but uh, uh, what, so what was it like being on, uh, I mean, I guess you shut up yourself. You said you just drove yourself. You were on tour, you showed up. Oh, that, that was surreal to be on the David Letterman show. I mean, I got to say, like, it was so weird, you know, and uh, Paul was like just a super cool guy and he really was the guy that got me on the show and then the studio is like freezing and apparently david letterman like would keep the studio really cold so that the audience wouldn't like uh, so they'd want to jump up and like stomp around to try to keep themselves warm i guess or to keep them awake or something like that We're like freezing in there man and uh but it was fun to play i mean it just came you know uh uh I was, I was kind of amazed in the movie to hear how, hear how it sounded because it sounded pretty good. You know, I, I, they, I mean, they have a high level of production for TV, so it sounded pretty nice. I mean, they had that great band and everything like that. How and, did you, um, how'd you learn the song? Did you rehearse it there or were they already prepared or how did it come about? I talked to Paul on the telephone when I was on my way over and he said he was just learning it off the record, you know? So just, uh, we, I don't think we, we might've played it like once or half of it. I don't think we did. We might've done a little sound check, you know? I think we did. It was very brief, though. And then um, they just they knew how to do it. And he, he had that lady. I forget her name now. That woman that uh, played piano on it. So Paul played a uh, organ and he wanted to do the song so he could hire her. And she came in and played piano. And, uh, you know, that's because that song's got like that big keyboard thing going on. it. And uh, yeah, it was it was pretty fun. You know, that record, though, was kind of like uh over by that point they were kind of not even like promoting it anymore but 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 it was exciting to uh be on letterman it was cool yeah um, i found online they do have the whole clip which i'll i'll uh, put up the blog that goes with this i will uh, show the whole clip and they introduced the woman who you're talking about i don't remember her name um so, so um so the six pack of love they they talk about the um album cover um so do you want to talk about that album cover yeah, that's an artist. It's, it's actually art, you know, that album cover. Um, it's an artist that's a quite a well-known artist in, in Los Angeles named Jeffrey Valence, V-A-L-L-A-N-C-E. And he's a, a well-known, um, serious artist, you know. And so it wasn't just like, you know, oh, this cover scares me. It's got one eye and all this stuff. It was Jeffrey Valence. We were like really moved that he would do this cover. Uh, you know, uh, you know, it, it, I don't know. That whole project, you know, is kind of an outlier for me. It was like a, um, a confusing sort of moment really in a way, because it's a long story and it's boring, but, but, but they, it was really getting hard to work with um, Geffen and, and they, and they wouldn't let me go forward with my records. The one I wanted to do, I was working with Stephen Bruton and some different people and, uh, um, I couldn't get them, you know, so they had me frozen 
And then Mitchell Froome wanted to work, and then they were immediately excited about Mitchell. And they go, we want you to meet this guy, Mitchell Froome. I go, I introduced you to Mitchell Froome three <laughs> years ago on my first album. He co-produced it, remember? They didn't realize that. And then, uh, uh, <laughs> and so, so he came in, but Mitchell was under a lot of pressure. To, and they, they were like, like, whatever you do, make, I, I, I mean, I don't know if they said this to him or not, but they, but there was a lot of, um, I mean, I remember Elvis Costello came to one of the sessions one day and uh, he came in, oh, this is fantastic, man. You know, you're taking what you've learned from doing the acoustic, acoustic music and now you're putting it to the electric thing and, you know, blah, blah, blah. He had this whole reason why it worked, you know. But to me, it didn't really work. Um, uh, it, that record never really uh, found its, you know, it's it's kind of, a lot of people like it, so I don't want to bad rap it, but, but um, as a singer-songwriter record, uh, uh, the arrangements took over too much. And so I immediately went out of there and did Sings Like Hell. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which is my, solo, my solo record again, back to that, because to me, that's like, you know, that's something I can make this really unique that really comes across, you know. But, you know, you, it was difficult working with the uh, major label at that point. So uh, uh, that got me through it, you know. So, um, you know, it, I mean, it's got some good songs on it, I think. But, it, but uh, um, you know, uh uh, there's a lot of as other aspects going on at that time too. Like I, I, you know, so, so it is what it is. I forget what the question was, but the cover <laughs> is Jeffrey Valance. He's a great artist, you know, <laughs> serious artist. Um, so one of the great uh, things in the film, uh, which I don't have any context for is um, they, they show you recording with a uh, lady Blackbird and um, Chris Pierce doing a song, uh, two angels, which was on your blue guitar album, I guess, originally. Um, and what, what, what is that? What was that project? Was it for the film or is there something going on with that? Um, it was for the film. And I think Chris um, Seafried wanted to, uh, um, who's the musical director on the film. He produced that album, uh, Black Acid Soul for Lady Blackbird, which is a pretty great album. It's a jazz record. And um, he wanted to, he wanted to make the case like that, what my songs would sound like covered by other types of artists. And so, um, you know, she's a great singer. A seriously great singer and i really recommend men that record black acid so it got great reviews in the, in the uk and um uh, it's a great record you know and so uh so that so that that was just in the film you know uh, that was their idea and they put it in the middle of the film and uh, i'm glad they did because i got to meet um lady blackbird and uh and chris pierce and it, it was super exciting you know <laughs> Um, so the next person I want to talk about is the person who produced this album. He appears in the film. Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, that's uh, Andrew Williams. And yeah, Andrew, yeah. It's either this guy or this guy. <laughs> uh, this let me see. Let me see. That's not him. It's the other guy. This one? There he is. That's Andrew. Yeah. So that's Andrew um, when he was pretty young. That's the um, album they did with Mike Campbell, yeah. Yeah, it's got a kind of an all-star cast. And they do uh, Inch by Inch, the Plum Soul song. Um, uh, it's got uh, a Stevie Nicks song. Uh, it's got, an, had a, at the time, it's an unreleased Dylan song, which just came out on the Bootleg series. Um, and uh, it's got... Was a Clean Cut Kid or what is it? Uh, it was... Um, Straight A's in Love? Straight A's in Love, yeah. And um, it's got uh, Bill Payne, Chuck Pluck. Chuck Plotkin, Jason Chef, um, Chalo from the Plugs. Uh, so, why don't you? Uh, so, why don't you tell me a little about him, Andrew? Andrew. Williams. Andrew. Andrew became a friend of mine um, in Los Angeles during the when the Plimsolls were coming up, and uh, so when we went in the cut a million miles away, he plays on it. He's playing the keyboard on it, and he sings on it, and his brother David sings on it um they're with me doing the harmonies we end with the other bass with the bass player of the plimsolls david pahoa so we were all like that's that group that you hear singing on, on a million miles away and it really is what kind of made it really work in a lot of ways was andrew um he's, he's a great you know friend and musician and so i spent a lot of time with him all during that period it was an exciting period and uh, uh chuck Pollock and was always over at their house and uh, I used to talk to Chuck Block, and we were talking. I was talking about Chuck Block and about doing a, a record, you know, at one point. I'll tell you, here's a weird J Dylan thing about Chuck Block and told me that uh, uh, we were so we were over there talking. We, we met Chuck Block and had an office by Gold Star, 
mm-hmm. Gold Star Studios. So, and it was, I think it was upstairs from Gold Star. And so I go over to Chuck Palakin's office and we're sitting around in there. And um, I said, yeah, I really love what you guys did on that. Uh, Groom's still waiting for the, uh, uh, the altar. Yeah. Waiting at the altar. And uh, how come that's not on the record? Because it wasn't on the record at that point. I had the single, you know. Yeah. He goes, well, it was rejected from the record because they cut it really slow. And then Dylan hated it and so they didn't like it. And so they didn't put it on the record. So Chuck waited a few weeks and then sped it up. And so when they were <laughs> so when they were getting ready to put out to put it out again, like he played it for Bob, like and Bob like, oh, I don't remember it like this at all. Like so he said, <laughs> but I, I like it. He said he sped it up until the point where you could hardly tell you can hardly uh you can't tell that the voice is sped up, but if you listen to it, it's sped up. You, you realize it but yeah so chuck was a great guy he he would just talk and talk and talk about music and you realize that that was the process that like i would go over to the williamsburg's house and it would be him and shallow and uh tony and and they'd all they all be standing there with the guitars on and chuck would just be talking and talking and talking and he would talk and like you realize that was the process with springsteen like when chuck worked with springsteen it, it, they i think with those springsteen records they talked their way through a lot of the problems you know they would just talk and uh I understand that impulse because it's it's an impulse to control people with talk, <laughs> but but I don't really believe in it in the studio. Mm-hmm. Like I don't want to talk in the studio that much. Like I I, I want like the let the music do the talking. Let your fingers do the walking. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> and so, uh, but, um, but Andrew Williams was, was really really helped me out during all during those. So, so he produced I think three albums for me, and I love all of them, especially the two in the middle, like the um, Full Service No Waiting. I, I, we cut it over, and you know it was kind of a lo-fi record um, that we cut uh, in this little office room. But to me, that's one of my favorite. I, I feel like in a way that's my favorite record I did for Vanguard. And then the one, the other piece after it was that one called uh, Flying Saucer Blues. And those two records are almost like a two record set. You know, they're almost like the, all the same sessions. Like they, they just went on, you know. And um, it, I love those two. I, I really feel like that, like that, especially the first one, they, they really, um, they were really exciting to make, you know, exciting. They were, they were, um, a new way of making records they hadn't made records before and we and i sat there with the acoustic guitar with the drummer who was playing on suitcases and stuff and nobody was doing that at that time and uh um now everybody does it but we used a harmonium which nobody was doing at that time but now everybody does it we sat there and just cut the vocals live with all that kind of stuff going on and then finished the record and um it was a really fun record to make and um, I, I still feel like it's one of the best ones. That the songwriting for it and everything was all done in a uh, kind of a unique way to that record. And I think I show some of, the, of that in the movie. Definitely, yeah. Yep. yep. In the- if you slow that down, you can see what the, what they show the lyric sheets. But if you stop it right there and look at it, it's like completely insane. These lyric sheets, you know, it was like this process of just throwing everything at the wall that I was I was typing, you know, and I had a typewriter. And that's what the lyric sheets are. Yeah. Um. So uh, let's get back to Dylan for a bit. The, so I, I, read, I found in a book that said on St. Patrick's Day, 1983, Dylan went to see you, uh, or I assume with the Plimsolls, on the three o'clock at the Music Machine in LA. It wasn't, the, this, it wasn't the Plimsolls. It was you solo? No, it wasn't me solo. It was um, um, Fast Freddy and the Precisions, and I was playing with them. What? So what's that? What's fresh Fast for the precisions. I'll tell you a story, man. Like when I was on Geffen, my A and R person there was Carol Childs. Yep. Okay. Mm-hmm. And she one day we were going down the street together, you know. We were kind of friends and I'm got driving around with her and, and she goes, pull over by the bookstore. And she goes running into the bookstore. I'll be right out. She buys this huge picture book of Bob Dylan pictures. And I could tell by the way she was looking at it that she was in love with Bob Dylan. <laughs> and uh, she was just going crazy over this book. And then she started being, you know, she became, her and Bob Dylan became uh, a couple or they were, you know, whatever it was, you know. Uh, they were seriously going out, you know, or whatever you call it. And, and uh, um, 
she told me she told me a lot of different things about it. And one of the things she told me was that uh, she goes, I always ask Bob like who his favorite group is in Los Angeles, who I should sign, and he always says, "Sign Fast Freddie." And the Precisions, they're the best group. And like the reason he loved them so much was Fast Freddy's set list was like Winoni Harris song. He had, it was a horn band with like mm -hmm. piano, like was uh, guitars. He had a guitar player that played kind of like, like kind of like Mike Bloomfield. It was this kid from Chicago named Harlan Hollander. And then they had this, this great band and like the drummer was like, uh, you know, uh, you know, it was just a great, great band. Like, you know, the drummer was like uh, Joe Jones or something, you know, and mm -hmm. they were just like a smoking band. And then they did like um, In Walk Bud, you know, and they did, um, uh, you know, just all the, you know, this great jump music mm -hmm. was what a lot of it was, was jump and um, and old songs, you know, and Bob Dylan loved it. You know, he, they learned all their songs off 78s. These guys are like an incredible band, you know. Well, I would play with them. I would play guitar with them, you know, and sing sometimes. And so we were I had. Um, the music machine and Bob came in, you know, with a hoodie on, I don't know who he was with, but um, he came in and watched this play. And then uh, everybody in the club met Bob Dylan, except me and Fast Freddy, we were too shy. Like we were probably like the biggest Bob Dylan fans in the whole place. You know? It was like, Oh my God, Bob Dylan's here. I can't. So I, I didn't meet him that night, but, but uh, I met him the next year, I guess, or something. Oh yeah. It went better. Huh? It went better the next well, time. Well, I don't know if it went better, but you know, it went. You know, it was it better than nothing. <laughs> uh, the the music machine that 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 that's that um, is that the story when uh, getting was that the get even with frat boys kind of story? Is that the music machine? What? When the music machine? Did you mention the music machine? Yeah, the music machine. Now, what, I'm I'm trying to remember a story you told about how you had this band, you had a whole bunch of bands called Music Machine. Was that a real story or was that? Oh, no, that was the Dance Machine. Oh, Dance Machine. <laughs> oh, man, I, I can't go on. I can't talk about that now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the Dance um, Machine. Yeah, I'm, that'll be in my book. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, obviously, you, you've covered a lot of Dylan songs. Uh, yeah, not a lot. You've, you've recorded, you've released a couple. You've done some live. Last time I saw you at the Stubble Vine Luther, you did Down the Flood. Um, and on your new album, that's the most recent one that's been released, which is this one. If we can see it. Um. In 1989, we played a gig in Montreal. Yeah. With me and a couple of guys, and, and we played the entire Bob Dylan first album in order. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big fan. Uh, um, so uh, on the new album, the Midnight Broadcast, one of two albums uh, that you... Uh, uh, yeah, that's my new, my latest album, Midnight Broadcast. Yeah. Uh, so it's got, um, it's a, it's a great album when you're driving late at night. That's the best time to listen to that album. It's just when you're just, and um, we uh, cut that album up in New England, and and, and uh, uh, we cut it on Martha's Vineyard, you know, in the winter time a couple of years ago. And like the inspiration for the album was up in New England too, because um, I was up there one night. I don't know I had a gig somewhere and I had to drive somewhere else. I was going down one of those highways in the middle of the night and I, I turned on the radio in the middle of the night. I was probably driving from Boston back down to Buff, down back down to um, New York City or something. I can't remember quite what it was, but I turned on the radio and there was just this great radio show on in the middle of the night, just coming in on the car radio and it just killed me. You know the stuff the guy was playing. You know, and I didn't. You know, it's one of those shows where like, what is this? You know, and then they would play another thing. Oh, my God. You know, and it's like it's almost like an experience with music that you only kind of can get when some DJ is like tuning you in and surprising you in the middle of the night on a car radio. And uh, I remember one of the things he played was uh, Easy Money by Bruce Springsteen and um, a couple of things that I, I'd heard on the Bruce Springsteen record, but I hadn't liked this nearly as much as I did in the middle of the night. I heard like, oh, my God, this is fantastic. And so. Uh, so that was sort of the inspiration for it was like to create a spirit, a, a listening experience like that was kind of like like being in a car in the middle of the night out in the middle of nowhere and having like a DJ like just play. So we actually have a DJ on the record, which is Ross Johnson from uh, he's from Memphis, you know, and he grew up on um, uh, uh, Memphis radio, big Memphis radio, you know. And so uh, um, 
when he was a teenager, you know, a long time ago. And so he's a guy, you know, he's a musician played with Alex Chilton and a lot of other people, but he's, he's a, a, a Memphis music lover. And so he grew up down there. And so he kind of brings that kind of, um, uh, uh, sense of Memphis radio to it a little bit, but you know, really it's like all lost in the airwaves and the, it's a kind of an ambient kind of experience. And then there's all different kinds of music on the record. Yeah. It's a good, and um, so you do uh, among other things, uh, you do a couple of Dylan songs, you do early Roman Kings and uh, this wheels on fire. And you also do, um, uh, actually I'm going to, I'm going to get back to that in a second. Cause I want to talk about the whole Kickstarter thing about getting the albums made. You have another one on the way um, and just the whole process and what's going on with the other album that's supposed to come out. Other albums, about 75% done. We, I just, you know, it took a really long time to get that going in the pandemic and everything like that. And like, I'm not, I'm not really one much for, uh, you know, sending stuff around off my computer and stuff. So, you know, the, the new record uh, has been recorded probably in the last month or two. Uh, I guess two months probably we've spent, but not all the time in the studio, but like doing some sessions. And so uh, it's going to wrap up. It's wrapping up, I would say, probably in the next, probably by, by uh, in April, you know, and uh, it'll be done. It's called Dr. Moan, and it's different from, it's a lot different from Midnight Broadcast. But um, I worked on it, you know, during the pandemic, uh, I was locked in this room that I'm in right now, you know, this room. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, um At first, I was really depressed, like we all probably were. And then I thought, like, what am I going to do? And like, uh, you know, there's a piano over there, you know, that I have. And I never get to play it as much as I want to, you know, because I, I, when I left home, I played. I was playing band, piano on bands when I was a kid. But when I left home, um, I didn't. And so uh, I've always played a little bit, but not that much. And I'm, well, I'm here. And so I say, so I'm just going to start playing piano every day, man. I may as well do it. You know, it's my opportunity, man. So I, every day I'd get up and, you know, have some coffee and play piano, you know. And um, at first I was just playing stuff like learning Jimmy Yancey stuff and trying to play, you know, In Walk Bud by Monk and different things and things like that and, and fooling around all that stuff. And then, um, and then I started making up, then these songs just started to come and they were like coming in the middle of the night and, and it was like silent outside in San Francisco. Like nothing was good, like probably the same as in Boston, right? It's like, they were, like everything was just dead and I would play these songs and then like these guys would go by like walking their dog in the middle of the night and go like, you know, yeah, I heard that, I heard you in there playing the piano. I like that one, you know, <laughs> this one or that. So that like, that's how the record was going down was like with, um, in the, in the middle of that pandemic, you know, but it took a long time. I wrote a lot of songs and um, it was a long process. And then to actually gear up again and to go out and start recording, I had to find a room like, like with the kind of piano I wanted to play. And I, it took a while. I, don't, I didn't want to make it on a Steinway Grand. I wanted to make it on a, um, I ended up recording on a Steinway Upright from 1906 uh, that this guy has. And so we, we ended up recording it uh, in a studio that had Steinway upright from 1906, but it took a while to find that. And then, um, um, so it's coming, it'll be coming out soon. Now, the weird thing about records is like the vinyl takes a year to press now, but the CD will be out and the, th the other thing will be up. And, you know, it's, you know, it's all crazy, but I'm, I'm, I'm really, ex really excited about this record. In a way, it's almost as much of a turn as, uh, well, I don't know, but, you know, I can't really say that, but it is different for me. This record is, a, is just another kind of different scene because, you you know, you make music uh, in the spirit, man, and the spirit, um, as it says in the Bible, you know, the spirit goes where it will, you know, and uh, no telling where it's going to go. And so if you're really following it, you know, I'm not recreating like another record or something like that. This is a completely different record from any record in my catalog. And, um, for one thing, well, you know, so you'll see when it comes out, uh, hopefully. Um, <clears throat> so, um, uh, so getting back to uh, Midnight Broadcast, um, uh, it, it, it's like, it's one of those albums, like the more you listen to it, the better it gets. It's like, it's just it's, there's so much, it's just, I, I can't explain it, but the, you know, as I said, the best time to listen to it is in the car, which is, I guess makes sense because that's what inspired you. Cool. But um, so, um, but also on there, um, there's a new version of uh, Just Hanging On, which I, I've been listening to so much of your stuff lately. I think it's the, at the end of your movie, but it, it may not be. But, it's um, what? 
uh, just hanging on is at the end of the movie is that what you're playing yeah you know the weird thing about just hanging on is that i wrote that song in 1970 hmm. and a unitarian church in hamburg and uh they gave me they used to give me the key of the church to go in and play the piano up in the um church they had an upright up there and i wrote that up there and it was like the first song i ever wrote that anybody wanted to hear twice you know <laughs> and, uh, i think they wanted to hear it three times but but uh no but it was the first time anybody ever at like these older people i used to know i used to play coffee house and they go like you know let play that one you know just hanging on play the song you know and and uh people we'd be over by a piano play the song play the song it's like these people that were into music so uh, it was very encouraging but then i never recorded it and then finally i put it on another album with guitar and then i realized i'd made a huge mistake mm -hmm. why didn't i just record it the way i wrote it mm -hmm. you know on the piano so it's exactly the way i, I wrote it is the way it's on um midnight broadcast and so uh it's like a lot of um music from you know also all over the place a lot of great songs and i don't aside from the dylan ones you know most i don't think i've heard familiar with uh, any of them but uh um so there's um oh the morning and president kennedy uh credit to sleepy john estes and which uh heart which harks back to the song i shook i shook his hand in 1986 uh, which before I even knew that it was based on a real story, that was to me that was the standout track on that album. I love that song. And plus, there was the acoustic version, which I love even more. Yeah, that might have been the best song. That I, I that song, um, you know, when Dylan came out with "Murder Most Foul," you know, I posted that song too because it's like you know, the, the Kennedy assassination man is like uh, you know a wheel that uh, you know the evil wheel that America got spun on, you know in a way at that point, one of them, you know, so I, it, you know, that Martin Luther King's death being the other was hugely uh, significant event for everybody. So um, I wrote about it on my, it was probably the first song, you know, one of the first songs I wrote for my first album, because it, it's an important point. But yeah, Sleepy John Estes' song about it is really heavy. I love Sleepy John Estes, man. Um, so Sorry, I, what was your question? I, just, well, like, wow, I didn't yeah, get to the question yet. The question is, and uh, for people who don't know about, you know, the hand you shook was President Kennedy's hand. Yeah, he came to, he came on. I was a little kid with my parents. And and uh, what and so how, very little. Really, kid what it was about. I mean, what it's really about. You know, I mean, that's the thing we're hanging the song about. But what it really is about is about the assassination of President Kennedy uh, and and how traumatic that was. You know, my parents loved. Kennedy and they kept me home from school um, the day he was inaugurated. And, um, you know, he, he was super important to us. And I, I was just a little kid. I liked Robert Frost because I saw him at the Kennedy inauguration one of the day I was kept home from school. And so, you know, it was just weird enough. But then when he was murdered, um, it was super traumatic. And I sat there with my parents and then we saw it, like, just like probably everybody did all the stuff unfolding on live TV and it was a super uh, nightmare. And so uh, to me, like the, um, the message of these murders was to, to shut everybody up. And I feel like that's what they did to Kennedy, Bobby and Martin Luther King, especially. And um, I think it's, pretty well documented that it was a conspiracy i don't know about bobby it's more confusing but the one with martin luther king isn't confusing at all and uh you know uh, uh the one with kennedy um you know i mean when murder most foul came out in the middle of this whole thing it was like so intense because it was at the uh in the darkest point of the lockdown and then trump was like out there raving like a moron and and you know uh you know uh to have that song come out and be about what it was about about the way you know it's still uh, it's still a, a very important subject because um because of the way um we've been pushed in america you know and uh in the world and the where the world's gone so i don't know you know but it, but but that was you know I know that was Elvis. I played that song for Elvis Costello uh, when it first came out, 
and he mentions it in his book, you know, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people that was Jackson Brown. And that's what the movie said that Jackson Brown took me on a tour because David Geffen, but David Geffen didn't get me on the Jackson Brown tour. Um, this guy that worked, that guy that worked, ended up working with the wallflowers. Um, what's his name? The manager. Um, he, he, he was like a super good guy and he, I'm, I'm spacing right now cause I'm a spacer, but, but, um, he uh he got me on that tour um with jackson because he was working with jackson david mm -hmm. didn't really have anything to do with it but that's what that song was and jackson asked about that song too and everybody would ask about that song and you know that in a way that's it's still a powerful song because that it's still relevant because because those things have never been worked out um like other things in america like you know the Anyhow, you know. <laughs> um, all right. Well, uh, um, just a couple more things, and I'll let you go. Um, so uh, this is this is a single that came out last time I saw you. Oh yeah. And um, yeah, speaking of the old days, um, it, it was uh, you you compared it to when the old in the old days when uh, you know those guys whatever they give them a, some money and they'd make a record and put it out. So uh, you want what tell song me is that on that record? It's um it's a cover of a uh, milk cow blues on one side. Oh and then, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, all the story in the world, which is one of your older songs. Oh yeah, yeah, so, yeah. And it's a great single, and it's on uh, where is it? On clear vinyl. Oh yeah. <laughs> um. So I uh, do you want to uh, just quickly uh, say how that even came about? Yeah, it's the guy Brian and this other guy Frank. You know, <laughs> and uh, like. <laughs> And uh, and they produce, uh, they work with uh, Malcolm Holcomb and a number of other singers. I like that guy a lot, you know. And he uh, he called me up um, just out of the blue and said, you know, come on down and make a single, you know. And that's what it was. And so um, we just went over and cut it, you know. Like they have a little studio up north, uh, down south of here, San, San Francisco. It's down in South San Francisco. And I went up, went over there and cut the record um, one afternoon. But yeah, it's cool that it came out. I thought it was really fun to go cut a record, cut a single on it, like a song like that. And uh, Milk Cow Blues, I'm glad glad I got to put that out. I think I put it out on another record one time too, but um, I think this one's better, you know, it's like the real way I play it live. Um, and so uh, I just to bring this thing uh, full circle, um, uh, one of the shows I saw you talked about the, the very first songs you wrote. I think one, one maybe was about Monopoly and one was about a girl you liked. Does that make sense? Yeah, I had a song called Stay Away From Me. I'm no good for you. And then I wrote one called Monopoly Board Blues. I had another one called Talking Christ Like Blues. And then what was the other one? We had a whole bunch of them we wrote. Me and this guy, John Duffett, wrote a whole series of songs. And, and uh, Monopoly Board Blues. Uh, there were a whole pile of them. 60 those were all done 69 or 60 late early 69 i guess um all right well uh this has been uh you know this has been a lot of fun uh i uh i wanted to um first of all is there anything uh i know we're still the, we're coming out of the pandemic is any aside from the uh the uh another album coming out is there anything else uh happening that uh you can talk about yet and for me, I'm trying to navigate, you know, they got this movie coming along. We'll see what happens with that. But like the thing uh, for me is like, when am I going to go back on the road? And, um, you know, I am going to have to go back on the road. But um, when I guess it's going to be you, I just got that call from UK to broke up the uh, our connection a little bit. But I got, mm -hmm. I'm supposed to be going over to the UK if they're not having too big a surge over there. Do you think they're going to be having a big surge over there, Harold? <sighs> I I predicted that Trump wouldn't get elected, so I don't know if I'm the person to ask. Yeah, I hear you, man. I'm kind of worried about it, you know, because I don't I don't need the you know the health issue, you know, but yeah, but yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm you know I've been through enough health problems, but but uh, uh, I am I am vaccinated. I, I think I guess I'm going to go. You know, it's yeah. kind of spooky a little bit, but um, you know, people are doing it, but they are all are also all getting sick. A lot of them, uh, the people I know that went on the road. So I don't know, you know. Um, um, but uh, I just keep writing, you know, and I, I think when I'm done, I have another, I have a couple different projects I'm working on after this album gets done. I have this, uh, um, I was working with this guy, Mike Van Farah, and he's passed away now, but he was in Lou Reed's band for a really long time. And, um, he used to, uh, 
play with electric flag too. And he's, he's really been around. He's quite a guy, but he, he, uh, I met him playing, we jammed together in Toronto and, and, uh, at a, at a gig. And he sent me all these tapes before he died of, of him playing piano and, uh, and said, I should read my book over it. Um, and it's sort of like would be, if I did that, it would be a lot like a tribute to Jack Kerouac because the way he plays a lot is like sort of a jazz style, but you know, I might do that, you know? And, um, you can play up here in Lowell and do that. <laughs> what? You can come up to Lowell and do it. Lowell, Massachusetts. I, I love that park they have in Lowell, the Jack Kerouac Park over there. Yeah. The readings on those things are like the great readings. Whoever did put that together was really great. Yeah, I told you what happened when I went to Lowell, right? I don't know. When I met Kerouac's priest. <laughs> no, I don't hear that. Did I ever tell you about that? <laughs> so I go over to this, I'm with this guy from Lowell named Al Perry. You know Al? He's, he's a Boston guy. And so Al takes me over to, you know, let's go to law. It's like an 86. So we go to, we're going to go to Kerouac's bar and I forget the name of it. We go into this bar and it's like this crazy old bar. It had this like homemade, like, uh, you know, fan system running pill pulleys all around the place. And it's just a whole bar room of guys like standing at the bar drinking. Right. And, uh, I go up to the bar and we're standing there behind this guy. I go, Oh, this is, and this guy turns around, he's a priest. And, and he looks at me and he goes, you're trying to steal my drink. And uh, he started, he's like, kind of, and uh, he turns out to be Father Spike Morissette, and he was Kerouac's priest. And my friend goes, this is Peter, man. He, he's, he, he's a writer, man. And Spike looks at me and he goes, you're too stupid. To, you look too stupid to be a writer. <laughs> <laughs> and so we started drinking together, and, he was, he, and then he ended up telling me that uh, he ended up talking quite a bit about Kerouac, about how Kerouac had taught him the meaning of mercy. He's a priest, but Kerouac taught him the meaning of what mercy meant. And so I love Lowell. And then uh, um, I had a good, that was a great experience. And then I went back to Lowell and saw that square, man. And, and uh, it's very beautiful the way they, uh, the, the, the readings there in Lowell, I almost like going back through and just copying them all out or taking pictures of them because the, uh, they're great excerpts. Like if you'd said, that, if that's all you read at Kerouac, those are some of the great ones. And um but yeah, so you know, I'm a big fan of all that. But but this, but that's one project. And then the other project, just to finish the book and get that out. And then um, I don't know, uh, just living day to day, really taking care of the people here and trying to stay cool, man. Keep keep a cool <laughs> head in insane times. <laughs> and uh, maybe like do whatever we can, you know, for the world, man. But like, wow, man, seventy degrees in Antarctica. You know, there's a war going on. on is, is your scarf blue and yellow? It's it is actually a little bit, but but it's uh, I've had this for years and years and years. And <laughs> that was my, uh, I live in a know. Russian neighborhood, you know. This is a Russian Ukrainian. It's a Russian Chinese, and there's a lot of Ukrainians here in this neighborhood, mm -hmm. and it's on up here. Okay, like uh, there's a lot of graffiti, and people are yelling in stores. The Ukrainians and the Russians, and a lot of the Russian people, like you know, they they get. They think that it's all, you know, there's a, they, they believe the hype, you know, and then uh, uh, the people are going in. If they don't, then other people are going in and like attacking their stores. It's on. And then it's an Asian neighborhood and there's like a lot of anti-Asian crime. And um, so it's like, uh, you know, it's a nice neighborhood, but like there's a lot of uh, unrest here. Just one neighborhood in the country, but that's what's going on here. I mean, you you know, it's Russian language and Chinese language out, out there, you know, you know, it's very interesting, but, um, you know, there's a big church in the neighborhood, you know, the biggest Russian Orthodox church west of the Mississippi, which, you know, they're so, uh, you know, they don't have seats in there because that would be too easy. It'd be too comfortable. People aren't supposed to sit down. You're supposed to kneel or you stand. There's no, it's a beautiful church inside, like incredible, but no seating. So that's an intense thing. But anyhow, that's, that's what's going on around here. All right. Well, like the movie, we end on a happy note. <laughs> Great, Harold. I hope, hopefully that movie gets out to people and, and like it gets some sort of way for everybody to see it um, besides just at the festivals or something. So hopefully uh, it's on its way. Um, but I have no, I, I, it's not really my movie and it's, I, it's like out of control a little bit, but, uh, I'm glad you got to see it and, uh, a few people are getting to see it. And, uh, as it goes out, you know, it'll be seen by more people and, and uh, until then, uh,
good to see you, man. I hope to see you out there in Boston, man. I hope to yeah. be back out there and to play. You know? Oh, definitely. Yeah, I'll definitely. If, um, if I can make it next time, I will. I will be there. And I watched the movie three times. Just you know, it's it's. It, I just love it. And uh, that's cool, man. I see you on social media all the time, man. Those crazy. You come up with the craziest stuff, like the best, like weird pictures of the Beatles and all sorts of stuff. The clips yeah. and all the stuff. I, I love all the stuff you come up with. Yeah, some people are just really into music and you know what that means. <laughs> yeah, you got a lot of interesting things there over there, man. I love, we could go on about that. Well, cool, man. I hope to see you out there and um, take all care. Right. Stay safe out there. And, and you too. And um, uh, take care and uh, all right. hello to everybody and, um, and good okay. luck to everything. Take all care. All right, man. Cool. All right.